Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Sal St. George's virtual road trip to the Phil Silvers Museum in Coventry, England. Wow, this is exciting. My name is Darren St. George, and if you've been here with us before, welcome back. It's always a pleasure to see you. If this is your first time, welcome to the party, because this is how we spend our Monday mornings celebrating entertainment, leaders, legends, and icons. We're thrilled to have you with us. Please be sure throughout this morning's program, make sure you keep your microphone and your camera on mute. Also, if you have any questions for us on Zoom or Facebook, feel free to add them in the chat and we'll relay them to Sal. Next Monday, Sal is talking about influential ladies of comedy part two. There were too many for just part one. So we have part two coming up later uh, next week on Monday. You can sign up at salstgeorge.com. This morning, we are joined by co-curator of the Phil Silvers Museum, Steve Everett, as, as well as John Higgins behind the scenes. He making sure everything runs smoothly. And now, without further ado, let's introduce the man of the hour, Sal. Dad, are you there? Here we go, turning on. It always takes a second. <laughs> That's all right. Good morning. How you doing, Pop? I'm doing great. Good to see you, son. I love this. Did you hear all of this? Everybody saying good morning? I know. And what I really would love everybody to do, let me know where you are from. Uh, Darren wants to know. John wants to know. Uh, where are you situated right now so that we uh, know where we're reaching uh, around the world, literally? We're thrilled uh, to have you with us. And to be honest with you, this is one of the uh, lectures I've been looking forward to for a long time. I've got one question in particular. I can't wait to ask Steve. So let's get well, the hang on, hang on. We have news oh. this morning. We have news oh, this morning. That's right. You're right. You're right. Go yeah, we it. have some news to share with everybody. Um, so as you know, at SouthStGeorge.com, you can pick up a mug, a virtual road trip mug. As you can see right here, we all have them this morning. But for March, we are looking for uh, your assistance. You can, If you leave Sal a review on either Google or Facebook, we're going to be selecting a winner from both locations. Every single Monday, they will be announced and receive a complimentary virtual road trip mug. It has a list of all the places we've been so far in 2020 and moving on to 2021. So if you leave a review on Facebook, if you leave a review on Google, a winner will be randomly selected every Monday morning and announced here on the program. And I, actually, hope, it's, I hope it's a good review. Yeah. <laughs> well, I hope so, too. I hope so, too. But that's not contingent on the fact. If you have a good time, please leave a five star review. But we actually have an announcement for this morning because this starts March. This is March 1st and we have our first winner. This, this review came in without them even knowing that there was a potential to win a prize. So we really appreciate that and they deserve it. It goes to Donna Winters. Donna Winters, if you're with us this morning, congratulations. We're going to be reaching out to you to get your address and mail you your own complimentary South St. George virtual road trip mug. So congratulations, and we'll have more of this later on in the program with links as well, so you can participate. Congratulations, nice job, Donner. Nice Take job. it away, Pop. Let's do it. Yes, let's get Steve in here. I know he's itching to get in here. It's a long trip. Here we go, all the way to England. Good morning. Oh, good afternoon, Steve. Uh, yes, good, good afternoon, Sal. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm very humbled. And I see we have our wife with us today. Yes, uh, Paula, my wife's here to, to do the camera work. Terrific. So the number one question I've, been got, I've received since I announced this, and we did this a long time ago, we, we scheduled you. Um, the number one question is, why is there a Phil Silvers, a nice Brooklyn boy, situated in England? Why is his museum there? Yeah, it's probably the most asked question we get in the museum. The museum's been running since 2015. And uh, to fully understand it, you probably have to look at the BBC who ran Bilco for 47 years continuously on BBC One and BBC Two. So it's a show. Um, the Bilco show has always been well received over in the UK. Uh, his biggest fans have always been in the UK. And although, although Bilco got 27 million viewers in the States on its original broadcast run, uh, it sort of fell out of favour with the American viewing public over the years. 
but uh, in the UK, we've we've never ever grown tired of it, and it, it's always been on TV. So uh, yeah, it's and Phil was a, a an incurable anglophile. He loved Britain, so to have a museum in his beloved England, he spent a lot of time over here in the in the fifties and the sixties. So he was a uh, yeah, he was a very very much an anglophile. So it's only I think only right that it should be in it be in England. Now, I know that you have been in touch with his family and they have actually donated some of the things we're going to see today. In, indeed. I mean, I was just thinking about it the other day. It's our 40th anniversary that me and Mick Clues uh, became friends in 1981 through the, the BBC screenings of Bilko. So um, and we contacted Phil between 80, 1982 and 1985 before he passed away. Uh, and, he, and he loved what we were doing because we were just setting up the Appreciation Society at the time. And uh, I, we have a very close knit relationship with his, with his entire family. So they just love what we're doing and they're only too happy to donate pieces that would never, ever be seen in public. So it's, it's quite a humbling experience to be able to show these to, to visitors. Well, let's get started. Show us some of the items that you are most proud of. Okay, give us a second. We're just going to flip the camera. Okay, it looks like a uh, jacket. Right, okay, bear with us. Let me just, that's it. Okay, so we're going to start, if, if I'll just explain, we are probably the smallest museum in, certainly in Coventry, so um, we're not a massive museum, but we do pack a, a punch, quite a, a potent punch. So this is the first cabinet here, and this is Phil Silver's Beverly Hills bathrobe. Um, unworn, the belt is still stapled together. So that was kindly donated by Tracy Iron, Iron Silvers. So that takes sort of pride of place. Um, we have some photographs in there as well. You might not be able to see because of the glass. of uh, Phil, when we... Um, we gave him a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame um, 21 years ago in the year 2000. Um, we'd, we'd campaigned with the family for 15 years to try and get him a star on the Walk of Fame. Um, and uh, Tracy said, look, we'd, we're not getting anywhere. Can you guys apply this year? So it was 1999 and, and the Hollywood committee accepted him and they gave him a posthumous award and a star and we, we were flown over there. Uh, and uh, enjoyed, uh, yeah, giving him a star on the Walk of Fame. Was that your first time in the States? It was indeed, yes. I, my, my first time in L.A. Uh, and then I went to New York in 2015 whilst we were setting up the museum. Um, I stayed with Tracy and we, we chose some pieces to go into the museum for our launch. Now, Tracy is one of his daughters, correct? Tracy is Phil's eldest daughter and he's, he's got five daughters in total. Excellent. Okay, let's see the next item. That up oh, there we go. I see. We're so we're going down here. Bilko box sets, uh, the Bilko DVD box set, which uh, we sell at, you know, exclusively in the museum for visitors. And the next cabinet here. I'm just going to open the door to this one so you can just see it a little bit better. Um, obviously, when Phil passed away in 1985, it was a shock to all of us because it was totally unexpected, and he was 74 years of age. He'd just given his blessing for the Appreciation Society, so we were, we were thrilled. And he also recorded a message for us on BBC. The BBC invited us onto uh, their programme called Pebble Mill at One. So me and Mick were invited on to talk about what at the time was the 30th anniversary of the Bill Coe Show on the BBC. And they recorded a special message, and, and Phil, uh, it was live, it was a live show, and, and Phil recorded this message for us. Um, and to say that he was uh, he was enamoured and, and, and honoured to have so many British fans. So in this cabinet, we have, when Phil passed away, is a pair of his glasses. So these are probably the glasses you'll see in a lot of publicity shots. Um, they're his classic horn rim glasses. Um, he had quite a number of pairs of glasses, um, but they're, they're pride of place. So they were given to us... Um, way, way before we set up the museum and Tracy and Iron, because uh, we couldn't make it to the funeral. So they gave us a pair of glasses and this jacket here, which is one of Phil's favorite jackets. And those are his shoes as well? 
And there are his shoes. Now, they came a little bit later. They were donated by Tracy and Irene as well. So they, they came here in 2015. This was when we were in the process of setting up the museum. You're quite fortunate that the family is so uh, dedicated to the museum. Well, we wouldn't be here if we hadn't got the support of the family. And um, it, it's quite astonishing that, um, you know, we are very humbled that they want to support us. Um, and Tracy has been to the museum. She came in 2016 when we were even smaller. So we weren't, weren't that big. Um, but they absolutely love it. You know, there is, you know, I can see my dad everywhere. And we're trying, we sort of forget that, you know, Phil Silvers is, you know, is, is their dad. And, uh, but they do appreciate everything we do. Okay, let's move forward. Before if we go up, because up, we, we've gone up to the rafters a little bit. So we've got some very rare <laughs> uh, quad posters um, and family photographs. Uh, these were given to again, donated to us by the family. So we've got, we just go over here. And you might see the glare off the lights in the museum, but these are family photographs in Phil's um, back garden, I presume either in New York or possibly LA, but probably New York. And that's with his second wife, Evelyn, Evelyn Patrick, who was Miss Revlon on the TV in the 1950s. And again, Evelyn was a great joy to speak to because she was, uh, although they divorced in 1966, she, uh, she told us lots of great stories about uh, the time she spent with Phil. Now, Bilko obviously is his most famous role. Um, do you feel that from that point on, every role that he performed was Bilko? I, I think um, I think it's what we call typecasting. Um, and Phil did did struggle with it a little bit. But um, if you study his career pre-Bilko, you'll discover that you know even in his, in his early Broadway shows, he was playing very Bilko-esque characters. So this was a character that sort of he sort of latched onto in the vaudeville days, and it just it just uh, escalated from there. So he. He loved the Bilko character. Um, he was very appreciative of the work it gave him and how rich it made him. Um, but again, he was, um, as a lot of people don't know, especially um, in the UK, that he did a, a, a raft of other things either side of Bilko. Uh, Broadway, vaudeville, radio, films. Um, he was a writer. Um, so, yeah, he did a lot, a lot of stuff. And he was also appearing in movies uh, in the 40s with Rita Hayworth and Gene Kelly, singing and dancing with them. Yeah, I mean, people don't realise that, you know, he started out as a boy singer on Coney Island, at, you know, a very young age. So, he, you know, he's, he always wanted to perform. You know, it, it was never in his family. Um, nobody else in his family were involved in, in the theatre or, or vaudeville or anything like that. But he had this yearning that he wanted to be on stage and... You know, as a little boy, he would go to the picture house and invariably the, um, the film would break down and instinctively he just jumped on the stage and started singing and people would throw coins at him and actually went home each night with more money in his pocket than his dad earns uh, in a week um, building skyscrapers in New York. Oh, well, that's the, uh, he was appearing at the Copacabana. And yes. uh, that's also Top Banana. I see on the oh, left. Banana. So, yes, you've got obviously his smash Broadway shows. His biggest shows were Top Banana, um, A Funny Thing Happened on the Way to the Forum, and Do Re Me from 1960. So the, these cabinets here tend to have, well, tend to sort of house the more personal items that we've, we've got from Phil. And again, these all come via, via Tracy and Iron. So if we just go up a shelf, we've got Phil's desk clock from his apartment, uh, his Los Angeles apartment, which was in Century City. We've got a wristwatch, which was donated by someone most of the audience will be familiar with, a guy called Ted Knight. Um, what else have we got? We've got the tally message from Tracy when we made, first made contact with, uh, with Phil, we've got even got Phil's Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences membership cards here. What was the connection um, with Ted Knight? 
Ted Knight um, uh, gave this um, this wristwatch to Phil. Um, for those that don't remember Ted, he was on the Mary Tyler Moore show and he portrayed Ted Baxter. That's right. And the, the face of the clock says uh, Terryville. So that was a lovely item that was donated to the museum. Um, we've got this one's a really real interest as well. Uh, I'll pick this up and show you because you might, it's a, might not be able to see it. It's the Friars Club and it's the 30th anniversary. Uh, just trying, yeah, it's a bit shiny. It's the 30th anniversary dinner for Mr. George Burns. And it's Phil Silver's table marker, basically. Wow. That's a lovely piece. You know, we've got a lot of, you know, this is why people travel to see us, because we've got such lots of rare stuff. I usually just get a cardboard <laughs> placeholder <laughs> when I go to it. Wow, that's a beautiful placeholder. <laughs> if we go up onto the top shelf, we've got uh, Phil's memorial prayer book from his funeral. We've got probably one of my favourite pieces in the museum. Uh, I'll pick it up just so you can see it a bit better. It's Phil's driving licence, his California driving licence from um, 1981, I believe. And I say to a lot of visitors that come to the museum, you know, look at that photograph. Who could have a driving licence photograph wearing a hat? wearing his glasses and smiling at the same time. So that is a wonderful piece. Um, we've got I, the, rec I recently saw him on the um, or uh, a clip from the Dick Cavett program, um, and he was sitting with Jack Benny, and he was so humble being next to Jack Benny. Oh, yes. I mean... Um, when we laid the star down in 2000, the committee put him next to Jack Benny. So if you walk down the Hollywood Walk of Fame and you come along Phil, uh, to Phil Silver's star, you go along the next one and it's Jack Benny. And they were lifelong friends um, and they worked a lot together. But, yeah, mm -hmm. they were more, you know, really, really close friends. Um, just close that. And then this, this uh, cabinet here, if I can just open. Hopefully you'll see it okay. We're going by the windows here, so it's getting a bit a bit bright. This was kindly donated by Laurie Silvers, uh, again, one of Phil's younger daughters. And this is Phil's favourite smoking jacket. Because whenever you see him in the, the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, so well-dressed, so dapper, uh, always well turned out. And this is one of his favourite jackets. So that was uh, that was really... Oh, that was uh, was that uh, the Riviera Hotel in Las Vegas? Riviera, yeah, that's a postcard from the Riviera. Um, it's not dated, but it's going to be obviously during the Bilco run. Hey, Pop, um, we do have a couple of questions here. Um, actually, we have a lot of questions in the chat, but I'd like to okay. add in. Uh, there was a photo of Phil and Ali in the other cabinet. Oh, yes. Do we know when that was from? No. Uh, they were good friends. Um, again, this was this photograph was given to us by uh, Laurie, Laurie Silvers. But yes, um, yeah, uh, Rebel Without Cause, as I say, with Rebel Without a Pause. So yeah, Ali, Ali and Phil were, yeah, uh, and, close friends. Thank you. And we have a couple of questions about his name. Was this his original name? Um, and then also, where did the name Bilko come from? Right. Uh, Phil's original name was Philip Silver. Uh, he added the S a little bit later. Uh, yeah, a little bit later in his career. Um, so, yeah, a lot of people, a lot of the media say that he was born Silversmith. And this was not true. And the family was trying to uh, make us correct it. So, yeah, no, he's called Philip Silver. And he, he added the S later when he, when he arrived in Hollywood with his first uh, Hollywood contract with, I think, was MGM was his first Hollywood contract. OK. The name Bilko was was dreamt up by the creator of the show, Nat Hyken. Um, and there's a couple of different scenarios. Um, Steve Bilko was a baseball player who was around at the time. Um, I'm not a baseball fan, so I don't really know a lot about Steve Bilko. Well, he also said Bilko, you know, they, they, they played on the word bilk, you know, to con, to uh, 
connive and that's that's the way that's the way they that's uh, the name that's the um uh, the, uh example i have heard the most that it came from the word bilk to bilk somebody yes. out of something yes yeah there is there is an image with steve bilko with bill silvers so they they again they met so uh yeah i i guess Bill Silver and Nat Hyken were huge um, sports fans. So if they weren't sort of huddled in an office together in New York and beaming up ideas for the Bill Co. show, they would be out um, basically betting on sporting events. Um, <laughs> Can you give us a, uh, a little background on Nat Hyken being, uh, he was the creator of Bill Co. and Car 54 and quite a bit of other shows. Vastly, uh, even in the UK, still vastly underrated. You know, um, he was quite a quiet guy, but he was, he, he, Bill said he was a lousy talker, but a great thinker. And he came up with these absolutely fantastic scripts on Bill Co and Car 54. Um, but he never, um, he, he died too young. Um, he worked for people like Fred Allen and Martha Ray. Um, so he did a lot of the early television as well, but Bill Co and Car 54 were his big, biggest successes. He also worked with Don Knotts. His last film was in 1968, The Love God, which I think he wanted Phil to be in, but um, it never it never happened. But yeah, Nat Hyken, he, he, people like Larry David, um, Vince Gilligan for Breaking Bad, they all cite, you know, and the, the writers of Frasier. And Cheers, they all cite Nat Hyken as a, a, a major writing inspiration. Um, and they won awards almost every year that the uh, show was on. Well, the Bilko Show won, uh, eventually won. It was, it was nominated for I don't know how many Emmy Awards, but it actually scooped eight, eight Emmy Awards. Steve, we also and, have a very important question from Annie. She would like to know, where is that cute bear from? Uh, <laughs> where is the bear? Um, let's see if I can open it. There he is. Yes. <laughs> it's down there. You can't um, get anything by our people. They spot everything. <laughs> this little bear, when we went to the Hollywood Walk of Fame in 2000, I popped into a shop and found this little bear with the Hollywood Walk of Fame on. So we just brought him home. Um, we, we didn't know we were going to be creating a museum years and years later. But he, <laughs> he sits in there because... Yeah, he's part. He's, he's a little uh, fragment of memory from from the Hollywood Walk of Fame. So yes, he's a little. It's just a little cheap bear, but he's 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 quite significant. He's uh, obviously yeah. he well, people very well <laughs> spotted. <laughs> Um, I'd also like to launch one of our first polls. We're curious, uh, everybody's opinion. What is Phil Silver's best movie performance? So that should be up on the screen. Feel free to cast your vote. We'd love to hear from you. The options are a funny thing happened on the way to the forum, summer stock, it's a mad, 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 mad world, or cover girl. And right away, there is no love for summer stock or cover girl. No. <laughs> really? Uh, no, okay, we have a couple people for summer stock now. Defending summer stock, they, they came to the rescue, but overwhelmingly, the votes are going to a funny thing happened and it's a mad, 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 mad world. Yes, yeah, so I can tell you which were. Bill's two favorite films because he he never really made it in 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 movies. He was never really his talent was never really um, uh, fired on. It was uh, his television, obviously, where he he got his big, biggest success. But um, yeah, his his favorite films were Cover Girl because uh, he didn't like a lot of his nineteen forties films because he didn't have a lot to do in them. Um, and it's a mad 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 world. So how it shook out, we have CoverGirl in last place, Summer Stock, second to last. Um, second place goes to A Funny Thing Happened on the Way to the Forum. And first place, it's a mad, 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 mm -hmm. mad world. Absolutely. Absolutely classic film. You know, it, it never dates, does it? And, uh, you know, um, a lot of people will say that Phil took that, you know, took that film under his arm and ran away with it. And there were so many, you know, A-class comedians in that film that it's... Uh, you know that was a no no mean feat to be able to walk away with that film, but it's it's a joyous film to watch. And he spends a lot of time performing with a child, even playing opposite that kid, giving him directions up the mountain, down the mountain, through the water. <laughs> yeah. Yes. He does a great job. 
What's uh, interesting about that movie, yes, he, he was great, and Jonathan Winters. The two of them together were brilliant. But um, the one that I always find interesting is Ethel Merman, because she really took that role, and uh, I think she stole every scene from every, every other comedian in that film. <laughs> there it is. It's a mad, 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 mad world. I know that they tried to remake this movie, um, uh, not Rat Pack, what is it? Rat Race. Rat, Rat Race. Race. Yeah, they tried to remake it, but it did not have the same energy or cachet as A Mad, 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 Mad World. What you're saying is they did not have the talent. <laughs> you know, the talent that is in that movie is just incredible. Incredible. My goodness, there's so much here. Now, initially, he turned down the role in a funny thing uh, happened on the way to the forum. Is that correct? He did. He did. He, um, yeah, it, I mean, a lot of people don't know that forum was actually specifically written for Phil. Um, and yes, he turned it down. Um, he went back to it in 1972 for the revival and uh, won a Tony Award for it when he was the first... First uh, comedy star to actually win a, uh, a, a Tony Award for a revival of a show. Um, and then he had a stroke and closed the show. So it was, you know, he was back on top at that, at that point. And sadly, uh, a, you know, the stroke closed the show and he couldn't perform in it. Now, um, I see all these Bilko images going by. And uh, we should mention that several prominent performers got their start on that program. Where, where does one start? You've got you've got um, Dick Van Dyke. The, the uh, yeah, the two significant ones will be um, Alan Alda, who was on two episodes, and Fred Gwynn started out on on Bilko. Yeah. Um, Dick Van Dyke. Dick Van Dyke obviously did two episodes as well. So yes, yeah, yeah. There's a lot of stars. Lucille Ball wanted to be, you know, have a, a guest spot on on Bilko. Um, third season episode, not a lot of people know this. Um, we reported about it quite recently that in a third season episode, James L. Jones had a non-speaking role as one of the, the two members. Um, let's, uh, we should tell everybody about the relationship between um, Bilko and Doberman. Do you mean the on-screen relationship or the off-screen relationship? Off-screen. I don't think anybody really knows the truth. We're, we're in contact with quite a few of Morris Gosfield's relatives. Um, I, I don't know whether it's the media um, sort of dreaming up some sort of conflict between the two, um, but I don't think there was that much. I think Bert Phil was very respectful. Um, I just don't think that Morris Gosfield knew how to uh, deal with fame. Of course, obviously, when he became popular on Bilko, he he, he had this um, his you know ideas of uh, grandeur and um, thought he was a big star. Um, but uh, I don't know. It's something it, we're looking into research-wise as to whether I don't think. I mean, Morris was a very sweet guy. Um, Phil was a very much a professional, you know, it, it was a tight knit team. So um, he wanted everybody to be on their spot, uh, learn their lines and ready to go for filming. Um, I think that was, show they filmed it straight through. I don't think they did. It straight through, yeah. So, you know, a, a 20, 23 minute show was filmed in an hour uh, without any breaks, unless there was a major scenery malfunction or somebody completely fluffed their lines. Um, and Morris Gosfield and um, Joey Ross, who plays Sergeant Ritzik, they were the two loose cannons in the cast because they were never on time and they'd never learnt the lines, you know, and that, that would annoy Phil. But I don't think Phil had any um, Ill, Ill will towards Morris Gosfield, but it's something we're looking into at the moment. I think in his autobiography, he mentions it um, pretty extensively about his relationship with Gosfield. And um, I think what you just mentioned about him coming ill-prepared was something that he uh, complained about, that uh, they would have to start over again with the uh, scene because they, they were trying to film it straight through. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the first season is, is sort of peppered full of mistakes. Uh, 
and they didn't have the money to re to reshoot. So um, there are lots of mistakes, but I think that adds to the spontaneity of the show. Um, I, I, you know, us Brits, we 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 pour over it over every every minute of the show um, because we enjoy it so much. But you know, in America, it although it gets sporadic rescreenings, it's never certainly now in in 2021 it doesn't get the recognition that, that it deserves. Um, there, have, uh, there have been a few shout outs for an episode called The Twitch. The Twitch, does that resonate? Does that stand out? Yeah, it's the first scene, first season episode with Charlotte Ray, who obviously went on to, to greater fame with um, Car 54, Where Are You? Um, so, yeah, that's one of Hyken's early ones. There's, you know, people ask me, what's your, what's your favorite episode of Bilko? It's impossible because it changes on a weekly basis when you, you know, you pick up <laughs> on another episode. I watched Bill Coe's Perfect Day the other day, and it's it's and you know, that's another glorious episode. So, yeah, it's it's very difficult to choose a, a you know. Steve, do you okay. see a difference between uh, British humor and American humor? How we see Bilko, how the Brits see Bilko? Well, I think so. Um, yes, um, I mean Phil, you know, Phil had a an innate understanding of British comedy, you know, which a lot of Americans didn't, which I think is why we've taken him to our hearts because, you know, he was big fans. He wrote a fan letter to Benny Hill. You know, Benny Hill is massive in the States still, um, not so massive over here anymore. Um, the Monty Python team, um, you know, he worked with, you know, musical comedians like Tommy Trinder. Um, he was on the Michael Parkinson show. He was on a Des O'Connor show who, who passed away recently, which we saw on YouTube. You know, and Phil, although he's this loud, brash American, he just seems to res resonate with with UK people. They just love his style. Um, so yeah, I, I I think it should be better received in in the states than it is because, you know, if you watch an episode now, it's still fast, it's still furious. You know, you you compare it to something like. Uh, I Love Lucy or The Honeymooners with Jackie Gleason from the same era. And as good as they are, they don't seem to go, they don't seem to be as fast and as furious as as the Bill Coe show was, and it still is. And and I, think I think it's down to Matt Hyken's writing style. Just I think you've reinforced um, the reason why the Bilko Museum is in Coventry, England. We've had a, a few people asking again, you know, they missed the very beginning when we addressed that question and you can hear it. It's it's the admiration of Phil for English culture, as well as the respect and acknowledgement of his talent by by UK, UK audiences. He's a very, very funny man. Um, yeah, I mean, he was the only American to be asked to to star in the the British series of Carry On films. I don't know if the Carry On films are, are, are well known in the United States. Did he live in the UK? No, no. That's 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 an interesting point because during his final years, when he was living in Los Angeles, he wanted to spend his final years living in the UK, but it never came about. But he just he loved the UK because when he used to visit here in the fifties and the sixties, he said. I just love the I love the United Kingdom. I love England because everything in it is so beautiful, small, beautiful, and well, well manicured. You know, he loved the countryside. He loved the pubs. Um, he just loved the British way of things. And and in the Bilko show, he would specifically ad lib and put um, uh, ad libs into the show, which were just purely for his British fans. So he'd go out of the scene and he'd go TTFN. Which again to Americans wouldn't mean anything, but it means ta, uh, ta, ta for now, <laughs> bye bye for now, ta, ta for now. Or he'd say, oh, he's blotted his copybook, which is a very British saying. And the American director of the Bilko show, Al DiCaprio, said, Phil, what's that? Why are you saying that? And he said, oh, don't worry, it's not for you Americans, that's for my British fans. So he, he had this yeah, innate um, relationship, really, with, with the UK. Um, and he loved to do these several things for us. Steve, so, can you tell us a little bit about that jacket on top of this uh, particular? Display? Yes. Okay. So on the cabinet here, um, I don't know if you can see it, I'm going to pull out this. So this was 
it was a piece of Hollywood history that uh, it was Phil's screen test jacket from um, 20th Century Fox from a film called Something for the Boys, 1944. So this was April 1944. Phil was a size 40. Um, so this was a screen test jacket that he was filmed in for a screen test, but it wasn't actually used in the film. And we, we actually um, won this in an American auction a, a couple of years ago. Um, but interestingly, again, the Hollywood connection, um, this jacket actually belonged to Debbie Reynolds, who was um, obviously Carrie Fisher's mother. But uh, Debbie Reynolds and Phil were, were close friends. But I think Debbie collected a lot of um, Hollywood memorabilia, and that was in her, in her collection. Yeah, so she, that wanted was a jacket. Her own, yeah, she wanted to start her own museum. Yes, yeah. Um, Bill Silvers, he played Harry Hart, and it's a brown pattern jacket designed by Kay Nelson and Yvonne Wood from Something for the Boys. So, yeah, that's a lovely little piece of uh, Hollywood history pre Bill Co. Um, if we can continue, Paula, you've just been showing us, you know, panning around and showing us all the objects. I have a number of questions that came in for you, Steve. If we could just do a lightning round and knock some of these out. Uh, of course you Paula can. shows us more objects, that would be great. Yeah. All right. So um, let's see here. Um, we have, oh, what were his growing up years like? Oh, Steve, you there? So, sorry, say again. Yep. What were his growing up years like? Um, well, he was born in Brooklyn, in the Browser Hill section of Brooklyn um, in 1911. So um, he was the youngest of eight children. So, um, yeah, it was, it was a tough neighbourhood. It was Murder Incorporated and um, gang fights. And, you know, and I, I think this is where his sort of Bilko persona sort of was born because, you know, he wasn't a street fighter. He didn't like the sight of blood. Um, so if he got into a fracard with any of the gangs, he would use his mouth. His mouth was his best weapon, so he'd talk his way out of, of any trouble. But um, he had, um, yeah, he had a, a pretty, um, I guess, normal childhood for, for a young lad living in Brooklyn. Um, but he was discovered on Coney Island. He was singing on Coney Island, was discovered by a guy called Gus Edwards. And that really, that's how his career started in show business. There's a question about his relationship with Paul Ford. Oh, they were, um, they weren't close offset, but, but um, Phil always said he deserves some sort of award for, for working and acting alongside Paul Ford without breaking into laughter because Paul Ford came to acting quite late. I think he was about the age of 40. And it was working in insurance before he wanted to, um, decided he wanted to go into acting. Um, they had a very good, um, well, it's obvious on screen, they had a very good uh, working relationship. Um, there's a question of where- although, You know, Darren, although they did not share any screen time, both of them, Paul Ford and, <clears throat> Uh, Phil, we're both in it's a mad, 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 mad world. Um, they have a question where can they see uh reruns of Bilko? Uh, maybe there are some on YouTube. I don't know if there are full episodes on YouTube, but I do know, Steve, you have this, uh, you have the full set in your gift shop, right? Online, okay. If uh, for your UK viewers, uh, sorry, for the UK viewers, yes, we've got the DVD box set. The Bilko box set, which uh, we worked on in 2014. So that is always available to buy through the website or when you visit the museum when we finally reopen. For your US viewers, uh, uh, Shout did do a DVD box set, which is still available to buy. Um, and a few of the channels like MeTV, they do do sporadic rescreenings of the show. Um, I will say that the YouTube Copies are normally very poor quality copies and they're not sort of complete. So yeah. the best way to watch it is, is via a box set. Yep. Um, they, they have a question. This is a, an observation. In some episodes of Bilko, the Colonel's wife refers to him as Jack and in other episodes, she calls him John. 
you'd be amazed how many of the characters' names changed throughout the series. Um, it was, yeah, yeah, I don't know the specific reason, but um, yeah, Flashman was called Zimmerman uh, in the early shows. So they did, they did sort of swap some of the names around, but Jack, John, I don't know why. Why there was a why there was a difference there? Why they did that? That's a great, a great, astute observation. Thank you. Um, I would like to send out another poll for the audience. What do you think is Phil Silver's best stage performance? And we have three options: Top Banana, A Funny Thing Happened on the Way to the Forum, or Do Re Mi. While that's while we're polling, cast your vote. I see in the chat, Steve. We have a fan of Dexter. Can we introduce Dexter for anybody who doesn't know? Uh, yes. We have, we have Kelly in the chat. She uh, She's calling out to Dexter. Hi, Kelly. This is Dexter. This is our little Romanian doggy, which we uh, we gave a home to last October. And he's just over eight now. And as you can see, he's, uh, sorry, yeah, sorry, eight months. And he's busy chewing on a, on a treat. <laughs> yes, that's Dexter. Good. All right. Let's see here how this is breaking down. Do Re Mi seems to be in last place. Second place is going to Top Banana and first place considerably with 67% of the vote is a funny thing happened on the way to the forum. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Yeah. They're hey, Steve, all uh, Steve, may I share a story with you about Top Banana and, uh, and Phil? Yes, yeah, certainly. Um, at the same time that he was doing uh, Top Banana, another show was on television and they had just lost a major character. It was the Jackie Gleason show. And <clears throat> they had to find a brand new Alice. The original Alice was portrayed by Pert Kelton and she had to leave for various reasons, which I won't go into now, but she had to leave. And now Gleason was in a situation where he had to get another Alice. And out of all the women that auditioned for him, uh, Audrey Meadows was the one that won the spot. The way she won the spot is when she went for her first audition, she went in, Jackie Gleason was sitting at a table. He never even looked at her, didn't give her the time of day. She did the audition as she was leaving. She said to one of the uh, uh, producers there, she said, what, what, what's going on? He didn't even look at me. And she, he said, well, I can tell you right now, Jackie thinks you're too pretty to play the part of Alice. And she said, oh, really? She went home, called up a friend of hers who happened to be a photographer. <clears throat> she said to him, please come to my apartment four o'clock tomorrow morning, wake me up, have your camera ready and start taking pictures as soon as you walk in. And that's what happened. She sent all these pictures to Gleason. She had no makeup. Her hair was in disarray. She was wearing an apron. And uh, when Gleason saw the pictures, he said, let's hire her. Any dame that'll go through all that trouble, I want her on our team. The important part is she was already signed up with Phil Silvers to go on the road tour, a national road tour, to do Top Banana. Right, and, she, yeah. and she was very uh, shy about it. She was nervous about it. She went to Phil and said, Phil, I just got the part. Everybody in New York wants to play Alice. I finally got the part, but I have a contract with you. And according to <clears throat> Audrey Meadows in her book, he just took the contract, tore it up, and said, go knock him dead. You're going to be a great Alice. He just let her right out of the contract. That, that was Phil. Phil was a very generous uh, man in real life. You know, he would he always give um, the unknown a line. He would never take anything away from anybody. Uh, as uh, Milton Berle once said, he was he was a pussycat. Yeah, you wouldn't think that from his persona. This is this is the danger of when you you play such a a well defined character that, uh, especially in in Britain, a lot of people think that you know Phil Silvers is this brash, gregarious, uh, fast talking army sergeant. You know, and they they think he's like that in real life, but in real life he was a very quiet. Family man, very very um, retired. Um, hated shopping. He, he would only he would, if he had to go shopping, he'd just go in and buy something and come straight back out. He, he you know um, he liked to be on his own. He he thrived in company, but he also liked to be on his own. Um, 
So yeah, he was the polar opposite. You know, obviously he only shared one trait with the Bilko character, and that was a love of gambling. But yeah, he was a he was a quiet man, very shy man. Um, I was watching an old rerun of a TV series the other night, and Phil Silvers popped up. It was Night Stalker with oh, Darren McGavin. Yes. And did you know who else is in that show? In the same scenes as Phil. Uh, actor called Ned Glass, who played Sergeant Pendleton. Right. So, yeah, it was a nice little reunion for them. Yeah, that was one of his last appearances, uh, correct? Um, TV appearances. His last TV appearance was 1981, where he guest starred with Kathy, Kathy Silvers in Happy Days, playing, uh, playing Kathy's dad. Um, but yes, I mean, this was all um, after he'd had his stroke. So, you know, the 70s, Hollywood is in the 70s. If you had an illness or a stroke or a heart attack, it was very difficult to get insurance and work. And, and the work just dried up for Phil after he'd had his stroke, which he found really, really infuriating. Um, but yeah, he did. He did. He carried on working. He did a lot of guest spots on chat shows, that sort of thing. Came over do you, and did the do you think? Um, do you think Steve Martin captured the spirit of Sergeant Bilko when they did the remake? No, no, I've not. I've yet to meet anybody that's actually watched it all the way through or has enjoyed it. <laughs> it's an army comedy. It's fine, you know. But as uh, yeah, naming it Bilko, uh, Steve. Steve is a fantastic comedian, uh, and I love his early work. But unfortunately, he wasn't cut out to play Bill Silver's role. Just as much, he wasn't cut out to play uh, Peter Sellers in the two Pink Panther films. It's like they have the franchise and they just want to use it one way or the other. Sometimes you think that the writers never even saw Bilko. Uh, well, the writer was Andy Breckman. Um, yeah, I'd like to speak to him because uh, the director was Jonathan Lynn, who directed... Um, Yes, Prime Minister in the UK, which was a hugely successful BBC comedy. So, you know, he'd got the he got the pedigree, but it just it didn't gel, it didn't work at all. We have a few things here in the chat I'd like to share. Um so one thing, Steve, I know you can't see the the chat, but I thought you would appreciate this. John wrote in saying this museum is incredibly full of artifacts and items. It's so satisf satisfying to see. You've only seen a small amount of it as well, although we're a small museum. There's so much to, to see here. And a few you... years ago, we had a visit by a famous British comedian called Tim Vine, um, and we just left him in here for two hours. He was just absorbing everything in the museum. So we're probably not the size of the Lauren Hardy Museum, but we've got a lot of rare stuff, a lot of very interesting stuff. Um, Dexter's, Dexter's trying to get in on the scene again. Steve, <laughs> can you tell us, I know you have an original script that um, his daughter gave you. Yeah, well, we've got, um, if we come over to this tavern, which we've not really looked at yet, um, we have a, an original script down here, to this one here, which was given to us by Mickey Freeman. So we were friendly with Mickey, who played Private Zimmerman on the show. Um, so yes, we've got um, we've got some more rare stuff to come out. And you're know, talking about uh, a funny thing happened on the way to the forum. Uh, this this was donated to us recently. This is actually Phil's script from a funny thing happened on the way to the forum. So we've got to find room for that. Um, could I just could we just see one of the pages with his dialogue on it? Yes, certainly. That's, Does he have you. any notations in it? Exactly. Yeah. How did he highlight his part? What were his notes like? It's Completely blank. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yes, oh, there, there we go. go. Wow. There we go. So when you display it, display it like that. <laughs> wow. Yeah. We've just got to find room for it. We uh, we're looking to expand again, but it just depends. How quickly we get out of this Oh, pandemic. that's lovely. Wow. Wow. What was the uh, situation with him wearing glasses in that play? Um, 
he wanted to wear glasses, but they, they wouldn't, the producers wouldn't let him because um, he thought it would be funny if uh, you know, he's playing pseudolus, uh, but he was wearing glasses. Right, let's show the viewers. Uh, uh, if we say we've got lots and lots of stuff in the museum, we have. That's Phil's um, original manuscript for his autobiography from 1973. Paul, I also want to say you're doing a, a great job today. Thank you so much. <laughs> Am I? That's good to hear. Wonderful. So really. there's a lot that's been cut out of this, isn't there? Yeah, I mean, the, the book... The book didn't end up how Phil wanted it to end up. So this has only recently come in. So we're going to go through this and see what, what material didn't make it into the book. I'm sure it's going to be a fascinating read because Phil was a very, a very honest and open and a candid man. So, um, yeah, I'm sure it's going to throw up a few interesting stories. Here I have another um, poll question. I saw a a uh, clue to this just a moment ago in your opening window, but I'm curious about this. Hanna-Barbera based this animated series on the Phil Silver shows, on um, the Phil Silver show, does anybody know what it is? The Jetsons, uh, Gor uh, Miguel Gorilla. Gorilla. Yep, the Flintstones or Top Cat. Yeah, we couldn't pull this one over there. No, this... <laughs> 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 yeah, there you go. Uh, I'll give it away. It's Top Cat right there. <laughs> and there was a question. Uh, did Steve do any of the voices on Top Cat? Sorry, did Phil do any of the voices? Yeah, I'm sorry, did Phil, yes. Yes. No, no, I don't even know if he was approached to do it. Obviously, it was it was a Hanna Barbera based the whole concept of Top Cat on the Bill Coast show. Um was, but yeah, Arnold, Arnold, Stang, right. Arnold Stang voiced Top Cat on, on uh, TC on, on Top Cat. Um, he oh, was actually in, <laughs> here's a good connection. You probably know this, but Arnold Stang was a comedian and he was doing an impersonation of Phil Silver's voice for Top Cat. But if we go back to it's a mad, 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 mad world, the gas station sequence with Phil and Jonathan Winters, <laughs> the two gas attendants whose, whose garage gets destroyed, um, one is Arnold Stang, and the other is uh, a Facebook friend who passed away a few years ago called Marvin Kaplan. Um, and he played, uh, the vo he did the voice of Choo Choo on Top Cat. They had two Top Cat voice actors and Phil Silver was in the same scene. <laughs> so Steve, I also want to point out from the chat, we get this, whenever Dad and I do a virtual road trip, it seems eventually we come to this conclusion with our guests and this tour is no exception, but I'm getting private messages for us to come back and do another tour with you. That so, because um, yeah, you've not seen anything. If we've got time, I'd just like to show you one piece over here. Again, it's, it's Bilko related, but it's probably the most historically important uh, artifacts we have in the museum. And in 2016, we were uh, we made contact with a, a New York animator called JJ Seidelmeyer, and he actually owned 16 pages of original storyboard artwork and five original animation cells. And he wasn't going to sell them; they were part of his collection. Uh, but we spoke a few more times, and I sent him some pictures of the newly launched museum, and he went. My God, you guys are just crazy about Phil Silvers in the UK and what you're doing is a wonderful tribute to him. So, um, so I'm going to sell them to you. So we bought what is, we believe, the only remaining original acetate animation cells um, from the Phil Silvers show. Wow. Wow. Incredible. And those are from the opening credits? These are from the actual opening credits of the show, yes. Wonderful. So yes, and we've got one of the uh, we a copy of the storyboard artwork signed by uh, the only surviving actor from the Vilco show now, a guy called Terry Carter who played Shuggy Sugarman, and he signed that in two thousand and eighteen. Um, the show was again quite inspirational because in nineteen fifty five, 
they had five black actors on the show and CBS and the networks weren't happy about it, but they stayed on the show because Nat and, and Phil insisted that they needed a multiracial cast. Wow. Yeah, there's, there's lots to see. There's lots more to see. And the, and the best way to see it is to come and visit us in person. That's what I want, Pop. That's our yeah. next, once that's we're allowed. Our, that's our road trip when we get done with all this. <laughs> we often talk about getting a bus and heading heading out to some of these places. I'll definitely take this one. <laughs> now, what jacket is that one right there? Uh, that's one of Phil's favorite overcoats. We've got two of his favorite overcoats. We've got a, a trench coat in the other cabinet over there. And this was, again, um, from... The seventies, I believe. Wonderful. Yeah. So before before we start to wrap up, I have one more poll question for our audience, and I I don't have any confidence that this is going to fool anyone. So let's <laughs> let's see here. Phil Silvers wrote the lyrics to for which of these classic Sinatra songs? Frank Sinatra, "You Make Me Feel So Young," "My Funny Valentine," "Nancy with the Laughing Face," or something stupid. Let's see. All right, it's a, it seems to be a, a fight between them. There's no runaway leader on this one, Pop. I see that. Let's see here. All right, uh, maybe something stupid is getting a, is starting to take a lead with forty three percent, but it seems pretty fair. Everybody's getting a shot, um, and there are so many stories in the chat talking about sitting with family, with parents, and watching the Bilko show and just laughing together. That's that's wonderful. And lots of thanks to you, uh, Steve and Paula, for today's tour. They, <laughs> they're they tremendous That's accolades. Thank you. Thank you very much. I hope, I hope everyone's enjoyed it. Uh, we should be reopening on May the 17th. So if you're in the area, pop in. Absolutely. Oh, and we even saw people that have been there. One person wrote in and said she's been to your place twice now and Thanks. highly recommends going. <laughs> right, Darren, the winning song. Go for it. Nancy with the laughing face. There it is. Nancy with the laughing face. The majority of us thought it was something stupid, but nope. Nancy with the laughing face was the lyrics were written by Phil Silvers. That's it. And uh, he, uh, Sinatra recorded it for his daughter, Nancy Sinatra. Yeah. All right. Excellent. Wow. All right. Steve. Hey. Yeah, uh, as we always say, uh, you, you've got a beautiful, you do have a beautiful museum here. You are trying to pack a lot into a little amount of space, we, but we uh, you we can you can spend hours people. there. But yeah, it, it'll happen. It'll happen once we get to, once we can reopen and start welcoming visitors back. Um, we, we've got bigger plans, much, much bigger plans. So, um, and we're quite humbled and it's, it's, it's a great position to be in, to be able to, uh, introduce Phil Silvers to future generations because uh, comedy has changed so much over the you know last 10, 20 years that uh, his influence should never be forgotten and we should remember the greats. Absolutely. Absolutely. Wow. Well, from the 50s, 60s, 70s, uh, you turned on television here in the States you always saw Phil Silvers. He was always a guest star on every, uh, the Beverly Hillbillies and Gilligan's Island. And he did pretty much every uh, sitcom that was out there. Oh, there he is with Alan Alda. Mm -hmm. Wow. Wonderful, wonderful memorabilia you have there, Steve. Thank you very much. You can tell we're just scratching the surface on all of this. This is incredible. Now you, have, know, a gift, you, have, a, you have a gift shop, um, Steve? Yes, we have. Uh, we have. We do uh, our own um, exclusive range of merchandise. That's always available um, through our Facebook page or through the website. Or obviously, if you visit in person, a lot of people like to take something back with them, a little memento if it's in the museum. So we have T-shirts, mugs, DVD box sets. Car bumper stickers. So yeah, we have a good good range of stuff. Um, here I can show you right here. This is Sergeant Bilko Vintage uh, Emporium .com, and that's where you can see every you know a lot of what we were talking about today. Uh, and you can also visit their merchandise. 
right here, you can see some of the things that we were talking about. Some of the t-shirts, I know there were questions about the t-shirts, if we could see, if we could order those. So yes, yes. you can. Yeah, you can, you, I say you can order them through, uh, through the website or send me a direct message through any of the social media channels. I'll, I'll pick those up. Uh, yeah, and we do full mail order facilities and we ship worldwide as well. And you always, uh, with a t-shirt, you always get a little bit of a, a Phil Silver's goodie in there as well. So we put a little bit of an extra in there for, for, for everybody that supports us because we do appreciate everybody that supports us. And speaking of support, uh, right now to get through this last wave of COVID relief, I know Steve initiated a, yes. yep. uh, I'm hoping last, yes, yes, <laughs> it's our last, let's call it, uh, a Patreon page. You can follow them there and support on three levels. Every donation is appreciated. Today's program mm -hmm. is, of course, free, and we're happy to do it and support our, these wonderful museums any way we can. Yeah, because we're, we're here, we do it for the love of it. We don't do it to, to make money. We do it to, you know, make sure that Phil Silver's name is never forgotten uh, and that he's still appreciated in years to come. Absolutely. Uh, and the family love what we're doing and it's, it's a great honour. So, uh, yes, if you can support us in any way at all, that's, uh, that will be very much appreciated. Absolutely. Also, you can watch today's program. It will shortly be up on Sal's YouTube page. Just, you, just search for Sal St. George on YouTube and you can view all of Sal's virtual road trips to the John Wayne Museum, uh, chatting with George, Bur George Burns family, Red Skelton, Lizzie Borden. It's a wonderful life. The list goes on. Laurel and Hardy, Clark. Okay, you get the idea. But you can watch all of them on YouTube. Be sure to subscribe. This way you know when the latest video is up. You can sign up for all of Sal's program at salstgeorge.com. The next virtual road trip we have coming up is to Cody, Wyoming at the end of the month. We have two road trips this month. So March 22nd, we're going to Buffalo Bill Center for the West. That's right here. And then later on next month, we're going to the Ginger Rogers Museum. Great programs. Next week, as I mentioned, is Influential Ladies of Comedy Part Two. Too many funny ladies for one. So part two coming up next week. And also at the uh, middle of the month, we have the making of Hitchcock's The Birds with once again, we have that special guest, Dan Bubeo. Uh, By the way, Darren, uh, just so our guests know, Dan interviewed Tippi Hendren on two different occasions. And he's going to bring that information to us. So we'll have a real bird's eye view of the making of this movie. He's wonderful. He's wonderful. We also have the road trips, the previous road trips on Sal's homepage. You can see them there. Lastly, Sal's shop. While you're on, while you're online, you can get your mug or one of his favorite Keep Calm the Coffee's On signs. Be sure you can pick it up right there. But also this month, you could win a free mug simply by leaving Sal a review either on Facebook. It's called a recommendation on Facebook, or you can leave Sal a Google review. And a winner will be selected every single Monday. We'll have a winner from both Facebook and Google. Leave a review and we'll reach out. Also, congratulations to Donna, this week's winner. I know she was in the chat. I was chatting with her already. And we're going to get that, get that mug right out to her. So congratulations, everybody. <laughs> Thank you again, Steve. Thank you, Paula. This was a really... A, Thank you, Sal. A Thank you, Donna. It's been a road trip. Thank you. Total pleasure. Yes. Absolutely. Also, thank you to all of our UK viewers. Uh, if you're joining us for the first time, I saw a lot at the beginning of this chat. It's phenomenal to see all of you. So thank you for joining us. And we hope to see you all again next week. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Have a pleasant, safe week. Bye bye.